Hello everybody and welcome to a new series here on the channel. I'm really excited to get into with you all. One that uh, apparently is not wholly original, but one that I, I thought of and then found other booktubers doing and quite liked. And it's going to be me uh, kind of going through the first chapters of a few different books here, picking which one grabbed my attention the most, and that'll be the one that I read, finish this week, and review next week for you all. And so it kind of opens an opportunity for you to not only experience a bunch of chapter ones and maybe pick a book different than the one I like to uh, check on out, but also uh, potentially read along with me so that next week you are uh, fresh off the reading experience just like I am, and uh, we can we can do a little bit of like a book club thing. It should be fun. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting this uh, going, especially because I'm dyslexic, so reading on camera for everybody is like a big fear of mine, and I get to challenge myself and overcome that fear. Yay. I'm not going to be trying to just straight up narrate, though. I'm going to be interjecting my own thoughts and tangents, uh, things to keep in mind potentially for when the full review comes, and uh, this should be a lot of fun. So without any further ado, let's get into the three first chapters we'll be doing this week, and that every week after this, uh, patrons will be voting uh, which chapters we'll be going through for which books. We're going to be doing Spin of Fate, Guilty Pleasures, and Mushroom Blues, a good little diverse set of what the fantasy genre has to offer, and uh, I actually originally had The Hobbit in here, but I forgot just how long chapter one of The Hobbit is. Uh, we'll be doing that another week. Not that I haven't read The Hobbit before, but I just thought it'd be a cool thing to kick things off with. But anyway, let's go ahead and get things started with Anita Blake and Guilty Pleasures. Okay, I'm a big Dresden Files fan. I think many people in my audience are. Not so much for the recent entries in the series, but overall, the big picture, Dresden Files was definitely a big part of my own fantasy-loving journey. But continually, throughout that process, people have been telling me, it's Anita Blake. Like, it is Anita Blake done in a different way. But I've never been informed on that. I've never known just how Anita Blakey the Dresden Files really are. So we're going to be uh, giving at least a small bit of an insight now by reading chapter one. And if this is the book that piques my interest, probably much more of an insightful, thought-filled uh, deep dive next week if I review it. But all right, let's go ahead, stop wasting your time and get into Anita Blake's guilty pleasures. Willie McCoy had been a jerk before he died. His being dead didn't change that. He sat across from me, wearing a loud plaid sport jacket. The polyester pants were primary Crayola green. His short black hair was slicked back from a thin triangular face. He had always reminded me of a bit of a player in a gangster movie. The kind that sells information, runs errands, and is expendable. Of course, now that Willie was a vampire, the expendable part didn't count anymore, but he was still selling information and running errands. No, death hadn't changed him much, but just in case, I avoided looking directly into his eyes. It was standard policy for dealing with vampires. He was a slime bucket, but now, he was an undead slime bucket. It was a new category for me. That's a lot of information in two paragraphs. Not like the most expertly uh, <laughs> delivered I've ever seen, but I can see the immediate prose comparisons to Dresden, at least in some ways. And also quite a bit of information was slipped in there, not in a remarkable amount, but I like that we were able to get, okay, we are immediately dealing with someone who is in a situation where they're regularly encountering the supernatural, but this specific vampire situation uh, seems to be a bit different. And uh, they, uh, they were able to describe a smarmy, slimy vampire opposite them, which that's like an important thing for any book that's going to have vampires. Just how like common, how, what's the experience of meeting a vampire going to be like for any character, especially your protagonist? And I get a bit of casualness, but danger. So that, that like implies a lot about the world iceberg wise, or it could be completely off base. I don't know yet. That's the fun. It's a cold read. I took him for a vampire at first. We sat in the quiet, air-conditioned hush of my office. The powder blue walls, which Bert, my boss, thought would be soothing, made the room feel cold. Mind if I smoke? He asked. Yes, I do. Damn. You aren't going to make this easy, are you? I looked directly at him for a moment. His eyes were still brown. He caught me looking, and I looked down at my desk. All right, so I think this is implying like vampires still do like have some kind of control over mortals, which isn't always kept with their lore, but I, we're getting that here. Willie laughed. A wheezing snicker of a sound. The laugh hadn't changed. Jeez, I love it. You're afraid of me. Not afraid, just curious. You don't have to admit it. I can smell the fear on you. Almost like something touching my face. My brain. You're afraid of me. 
because I'm a vampire. I shrugged. What could I say? How do you lie to someone who can smell your fear? Why are you here, Willie? Jeez. I just wish I had a smoke. The skin began to jump around the corner of his mouth. I didn't think vampires had nervous twitches. His hands went up, almost touched it. He smiled, flashing fangs. Some things don't change. I wanted to ask him, what does change? How does it feel to be dead? I knew other vampires, but Willie was the first I had known before and after death. It was a peculiar feeling. What do you want? Hey, I'm here to give you money to become a client. I glanced up at him, avoiding his eyes. His tie tack caught the overhead lights. Real gold. Willie had never had anything like that before. He was doing all right for a dead man. I raised the dead for a living, no pun intended. Why would a vampire need a zombie raised? He shook his head, two quick jerks to either side. No, no voodoo stuff. I want to hire you to investigate some murders. I'm not a private investigator, but you got one of them on retainer with your outfit. Okay, I'm seeing <laughs> the Dresden parallels a little bit immediately. We have someone who's hired to be a private investigator into supernatural matters. Fair. But here's the thing. It's probably totally valid to point out a bunch of similarities from Dresden to Anita Blake. I'm not going to be trying to even, like, say people are wrong in that because we just never know. It could be a case of parallel thinking or it could be inspired by. But either way is totally fine. Like, I am heavily inspired in my own writings, for sure. Cyberpunk 2077 absolutely inspired a whole lot of uh, neon ghosts. And I'm not going to try and hide that. The only thing that, like, makes anything being directly inspired by something skeevy is if an author tries to be like, Puh. no, I wasn't. It was all me. I'm brilliant and original. No one's original. There are lines. Like, obviously, I would say Terry Goodkind, for example, crossed those lines. But the only reason those lines really existed for him to cross was he would vocally say, like, I'm not ripping off anyone. Everything's totally original when he was clearly ripping off a bunch of people. Um, so I don't know. To me, it kind of comes down to, like, how the author's treating the work, but maybe I'm wrong there. Anyway, back into the book. I nodded. You could just hire Miss Sims directly. You don't have to go through me for that. Again, that jerky head shake. But she don't know about vampires the way you do. I sighed. Can we cut to the chase here, Willie? I have to leave. I glanced at the wall clock. In 15 minutes, I don't like to leave a client waiting alone in the cemetery. They tend to get jumpy. All right, okay, well, <laughs> meeting in a cemetery. Maybe there's some Buffy parallels. Let's get into it. That's also the thing, like, when you're thinking of supernatural investigator stuff, there's just gonna be some times where it's like, yeah, where are they gonna meet with supernatural people? The cemetery. Maybe I'm biased thinking that's a normal uh, meeting location because there's a cemetery right outside this window here. Uh, but I don't know. I don't think that's a bad place to try to arrange a supernatural meeting if you're a supernatural person. But maybe it, maybe it is a very bad place because if you're in a world where there's real supernatural stuff, you're going to want to be avoiding the places that people are going to be hunting for supernatural. Like, so maybe that's actually a horrible place. Yeah, I wouldn't schedule my meetings in there. Okay, I'm glad we decided on that. That's a, that's a, that's a worthwhile tangent. Good job. Glad to hear you've been productive. He laughed. I found the snickering laugh comforting, even with the fangs. Surely vampires should have rich, melodious laughs. I'll bet they do, I'll bet they do. His face sobered suddenly, as if a hand had wiped his laughter away. I felt fear like a jerk in the pit of my stomach. Vampires could change movements, like clicking a switch. If he could do that, what else could he do? You know about the vampires that are getting wasted over in the district? He made it a question, so I answered. I'm familiar with them. Four vampires had been slaughtered in the new vampire club district. Their hearts had been torn out their heads cut off. You still working with the cops? I'm still on retainer with the new task force. Okay, also working with the police. All right, there, there's a lot of Dresden Files <laughs> parallels here. Okay, let's, how many more are gonna come up in just chapter one? He laughed again. Yeah, the spook squad, under budgeted and undermanned. Right. You've described most of the police work in this town. I'm gonna say the dialogue, a little bit stilted here, but not terrible. Maybe. But the cops feel like you do, Anita. What's one more dead vampire? New laws don't change that. Well, there's a distinct difference. Uh, in the Dresden Files, the police are very against the existence of the supernatural, except for like one or two who are in the know. Uh, and this is implying that like a lot of uh, the police are aware of it. And uh, yeah, okay. The, some differences. It had only been two years since Addison v. Clark. The court case gave us a revised version of what life was and what death wasn't. Vampirism was legal in the good old US of A. Wow, okay, that's a bold choice. We were one of the few countries to acknowledge them. 
The immigration people were having fits trying to keep foreign vampires from immigrating in. Well, flocks. Okay, now I'm having some worries. I'm sorry to be doing so many tangents in like just such a few amount of pages, but I'm writing a book about the discovery of the supernatural world happening in DC. And the main character is uh, a ghost type person who is like working as not a private investigator, working for the bad guys. Essentially think of like Mike from Breaking Bad. Uh, they're, they're someone you call in if like a vampire killed somebody to like clean the scene. And so I'm like, now I'm worried. How many parallels are my book gonna have with this? Cause it's about trying to clean up and avoid recognition from the United States. I, I, this seems different. It seems different. But now am I pulling a dress in files? F All sorts of questions have been fought out in court. Do heirs have to give back their inheritance? Were you widowed if your spouse became undead? Was it murder to slay a vampire? There was even a movement to give them the vote. Times were a changing. Wow, the answer to every single one of those questions is no. I guess I just outed myself as pro vampire slaying, but as cool as I think vampires are, if there was a creature that had to feed on living human blood, yeah, I'd, I'd be pro wiping them out. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. I stared at the vampire in front of me and shrugged. Do I really believe what was one more dead vampire? Maybe. If you believe I feel that way, why come to me at all? Because you're the best at what you do. We need the best. It was the first time he had said, we. Who are you working for, Willie? He smiled then, a close, secretive smile, like he knew something I should know. Never you mind that. Money's real good. We want someone who knows the night left to be looking into these murders. I've seen the bodies, Willie. I gave my opinions to the police. What'd you think? He leaned forward in the chair, small hands flat on my desk. His fingernails were pale, almost white bloodless. I gave a full report to the police. I stared up at him, almost looking him in the eye. Wow, there's even the eye avoidance thing from Dresden Files. Okay, anyway, it's a little bit presented different in Dresden Files. I think it's because Dresden's implying he might be like mildly happy. It's from Dresden, not because of vampire, but that's just like another thing standing like a beacon here. Won't even give me that, will ya? I'm not at liberty to discuss police business with you. I told him you wouldn't go for this. Go for what? You haven't told me a damn thing. We want you to investigate the vampire killings. Find out who's or what's doing it. We'll pay you three times your normal rate. I shook my head. That explained why Bert, the greedy son of a gun, had set up this meeting. He knew how I felt about vampires, but my contract forced me to at least meet with any client that had given Bert a retainer. My boss would do anything for money. Problem was, he thought I should too. Bert and I were having a talk very soon. Oh, I like that conflict. That's a good dynamic here to have her like actually stuck in a position where it's like, I have a certain set of skills, but you have to have a handler. And yeah, that handler might not necessarily have the exact same values as you. And no, I completely agree with her. Vampires should be murderable. Like I would not want to work for a vampire either if they're being presented in the classical, like have a demon within them kind of thing. And they're not even really the human that they once were, which I, I think that's the implication of how vampires are being presented so far. Um, yeah, I'm I am a hundred percent with Anita Blake so far in this book. I stood. The police are looking into it. I'm already giving them all the help I can. In a way, I am already working on the case. Save your money. Take the money from the vampire. He sat staring up at me, very still. It was not that lifeless immobility of the long dead, but it was a shadow of it. Fear ran up my spine and into my throat. I fought an urge to draw my <laughs> I almost just read that as cervix. <laughs> I fought an urge to draw my crucifix out of my shirt and drive him from my office. Somehow, throwing a client out using a holy item seemed less than professional, so I just stood there, waiting for him to move. Why won't you help us? She already- you know that! She doesn't like you. I don't like you either. I have clients to meet, Willie. I'm sorry that I can't help you. Won't help, you mean. I nodded. Have it your way. I walked around the desk to show him the door. He moved with a liquid quickness that Willie never had, but I saw him move and was one step back from his reaching hand. I'm not just another pretty face to fall for your mind tricks. You saw me move. I heard you move. You're the new dead, Willie. Vampire or not, you've got a lot to learn. He was frowning at me, hand still half extended toward me. Maybe, but no human could have stepped out of reach like that. He stepped up close to me, plaid jacket nearly brushing against me, pressed together like that. We were nearly the same height, short. His eyes were on a perfect level with mine. I stared as hard as I could at his shoulder. It took everything I had not to step back from him. But damn it, undead or not, he was Willie McCoy. I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. He said, you ain't human any more than I am. I'm not even gonna say it at this point. I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> this is like a checklist of plot elements set up in Dresden. Okay, I did say it. You know how hard it was for me to read Dresden Ow. and knowing this, I was just like, this 
Yes! I need a blank! I moved to open the door. I hadn't stepped away from him. I had stepped away to open the door. I tried convincing the sweat along my spine that there was a difference. The cold feeling in my stomach wasn't fooled either. I really have to be going now. Thank you for thinking of Animators Inc. That's a great name for someone who's involved in necromancy. What? Oh, uh, if you haven't watched Reanimator and you want to see something really fucked up, watch Reanimator. I gave him my best professional smile, empty of meaning as a light bulb, but dazzling. He paused in the open doorway. Why won't you work for us? I gotta tell him something when I go back. I wasn't sure, but there was something like fear in his voice. Would he get in trouble for failing? I felt sorry for him and knew it was stupid. He was the undead, for heaven's sake. But he stood looking at me, and he was still Willy, with his funny coats and small nervous hands. Tell them, whoever they are, I don't work for vampires. A firm rule? Again, he made it sound like a question. Concrete. There was a flash of something on his face, the old Willy peeking through. It was almost a pity. I wish you hadn't said that, Anita. These people don't like anybody telling them no. I think you overstayed your welcome. I don't like to be threatened. It ain't a threat, Anita. It's the truth. He straightened his tie, fondling the new gold tie tack, squared his thin shoulders, and walked out. Is a tie tack like a, a tie clip? I assume it's a tie clip. Or the tie tack tie clip? I'll Google it and have an image on screen. I closed the door behind him and leaned against it. My knees felt weak, but there wasn't time for me to sit there and shake. Miss Grundick was probably already at the cemetery. She would be standing there with her little black purse and her grown sons waiting for me to raise her husband from the dead. There was a mystery of two very different wills. It was either years of court costs and arguments or raise Albert Grundick from the dead and ask. Everything I needed was in my car even the chickens. <laughs> I drew the silver crucifix free of my blouse and let it hang in full view. I have several guns and I know how to use them. I keep a nine millimeter Browning high powered in my desk. The gun weighed a little over two pounds, silver plated bullets and all. Silver won't kill a vampire, but I can discourage them. It forces them to have to heal the wounds, almost human slow. I wiped my sweaty palms on my shirt and went out. Craig, our night secretary, was typing furiously at the computer keyboard. His eyes widened as I walked over the thick carpeting. Maybe it was the cross swinging on his long chain. Maybe it was the shoulder rig tight across my back. The gun out in plain sight. He didn't mention either. Smart man. I put my nice little corduroy jacket over it all. The jacket didn't lie flat over the gun, but that was okay. I doubted the Grundicks and their lawyers would notice. That was an interesting chapter one. I liked that quite a bit. Uh, Anita Blake has personality. The prose aren't phenomenal. and The dialogue isn't my favorite, but I'm a sucker for urban fantasy worlds that have that kind of, I guess it's just cliche Buffy setting or, you know, supernatural versus people working against it. But I like that instead of getting the standard like, oh, she's some kind of angelic person or better than all, she's just someone who's working necromancy, which in itself has all kinds of moral implications. Uh, yeah, that's good. I, I, I could see myself continuing on with guilty pleasures quite a bit, but we have two other entrants to judge as well. And uh, I'm going to take a sip here and we shall transfer into Mushroom Blues. Okay, that didn't take an absurd amount of time to figure out because of a dumb mistake on my end. This has absolutely just been a couple of seconds for me. <laughs> I overcomplicated things for myself because the answer was so simple as right in front of my phrase, just a drag and drop something. Anyway, Kobo's been great. I switched over to one after using the Kindle in the e-reader video that I did, and uh, it's been really wonderful. If you want me to make a Kobo vs. Kindle experience video, I'm happy to do that uh, as well as a follow-up because this is what everyone ended up recommending and I'm glad they did because I've been, I've been quite happy with mine. Let's talk about fungus. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be reading a fungal punk book called Mushroom Blues. It's chapter one by Adrian M. Gibson Gibbons and they reached out to me on Instagram. Actually, I covered this cover in Fantasy News, so it was kind of put on my radar and now I've really wanted to get through it because I love cyberpunk. I love noir this seems like fungal punk is going to be fitting right on into that, just going off the marketing. And I'm always down for a fungal punky time, a funky, a funk time, a fun, fungal punk funk. We're having a funk time. Chapter one, mold and mutilation. Case file number 42 through 56, Spirit Island, 554 AM. No good day ever started with death before coffee. I stood on the shoreline of Spirit Island, gazing upon a lumpy trash bag. It was nestled in an icy bed of seaweed next to a rotting micro paper lantern. A handful of bioluminescent motes 
floated above the water, waves lapping against the bag where a large rip revealed a pale patch of hairless skin. Pungent saltiness rose up from algae and cold ocean spray, overpowering whatever I was about to find in there. I took out a face mask and put it on, NKPD protocol, and no way I would let anything contaminate me. My feet crunched on gray sand as I adjusted my weight, heart beating faster. The bag was too small, especially for a body, but I knew what must be inside. Why else would dispatch have sent me a 187 code on my pager? Before touching the crime scene, I took out my voice recorder. Detective Harrietta Hoffman, 19th of 12th month, Spirit Island, black bag suspected murder. I sighed and put the recorder away, staring down into a brackish pool amidst the seaweed. There were puffy bags under my dull green eyes. My lips were chapped and my hair straggly. I hadn't had time to fix myself up, rolling out of bed to rush over here. Not that anyone would give a shit what the middle-aged female detective looked like, wrinkles and all. God damn, I needed some caffeine. Gray clouds threatened snow, and bitter wind rippled across Kanoko Bay, whipping my ponytail and sending strays of gray blonde hair across my face. I pulled my trench coat tight with a shudder. I yawned. Nightmares of a car on fire had kept me up last night. It was a miracle I'd even remembered mittens. Anything to shield my skin from winter's frigid touch was welcome. I put aside personal gripes to focus on why I was here. That bag. My life, I think that was a little bit too much of an aside from the bag. The structure of this scene is is a little disjointed for me, but I'm getting into like already the feeling of the world, the tone. That's all successfully being established. Sticky wet accumulated inside my mittens. Finger-like fungi wriggling everywhere. This wasn't the first dead body I'd seen either. Not even close. But God, I f***ing hated mushrooms and mold and the whole bloody mycological lot. Not a day would go by in Neo Kanoko where I wouldn't curse Frederick for exiling me here. That prick. I had to get my sh together. Focus. Forget about my bastard ex-husband. He could rot in a pile of f***ing fungi for all I cared. Reaching inside my jacket, I traded the warmth of my mittens for a pair of examination gloves. A shock of cold greeted my hands as I bent down. Both of my knees cracked with the weight of age. The writing here is definitely the biggest hurdle for me to actually be able to connect with this story so far. I really like the concept of a middle-aged detective getting into like an urban fantasy mystery. I mean, the jaded detective is such a trope for a reason. It's so enjoyable. I just really am feeling this could have used a bit more of an edit, but I can see the premise possibly still winning me over here. Down at bag level, that, that's a weird way to put that. I could already smell something foul. Hints of brine and decomposition invaded my nose. The scent memory of a foul combination lingered on my tongue. Snapping on the gloves, I examined the bag. Seaweed draped across the black plastic, as if trying to pull it back into the sea. I spotted remnants of thick blue rope tucked between the green-brown folds. Could have been tied to something to weigh it down. Bricks? Or rocks? There were small Hipponi's logograms on the rope. I couldn't read them, so I made a mental note to check with forensics and get them translated. Nothing else was visible. Ah, there's something here where it's... I, I understand where stylization is going to try and sink me deeper into this scene, and it works on a sentence-to-sentence -sentence level. It's where you zoom out even one step, just to like how a paragraph, like what information it's communicating, how it's helping the scene flow from previous to next, that I'm having some trouble. When we're so close to a protagonist immediately, I really want their stream of consciousness to be coherent from start to finish and that consciousness be used as an excuse to establish a scene, a world, a story. And while I'm liking the story that is being set up, that actual and more surface level of communication is what's frustrating me here. I pinched the ripped opening and lifted it. First to hit me was the stench. The brine was just a sample, nothing compared to the punch of putrid flesh now wafting from the opening. Tiny red crabs with slime mold and fruiting bodies on their shells scuttled out of the bag. I shifted through the muck and then I felt it, something round and bloated. I widened the opening, wincing as I stared in the eyeless cavities of a fungal child's human-like face. Oh, you're also starting your book with murdering a kid. I've done that as well. It's a good way to go. It's like instant, immediate emotional stakes. Who killed Laura Palmer? You're, who killed her? You want to know? It's a strong opening choice every time. And you add in the dynamics of like, there's a divided society, you know, things are changing. This detective's on an opinionated side of, I, like all those things immediately work because yeah, they're tried and true, but they're tried and true. Memories flooded my mind, playing in the grassy backyard, sledding in winter, summertime visits to the cabin in Southern Caprina, jumping off the lakeside dock, then a memory turned nightmare. Fire, blood, fear, screaming. I was hunted by the imagery of Elizabeth. Her face stared back at me, cold and empty, features that were a subtle blend of Frederick's and my own. 
I winced, suppressed recollections, bound by trauma, alcohol, and years of destructive behavior. Bloody hell, I had to focus. Okay, so we're not going for a subtle uh, approach to characterization. That's fine. It's just here. Bam. <laughs> Bloody hell, I had to focus. I turned away from the bag and into the crisp ocean breeze, trying to escape the repulsive smell and taste. The thought of a dead kid chilled me, but deep down, I was more disgusted by the fact that the victim was a fungal. I could hardly stand to see mushrooms on a dinner plate let alone be in presence of mushroom people, even when they were a corpse. See, I, I don't follow the like logical jump there. I totally understand what we're doing here for the character, but for me, like I cannot stand olives. I think they're absolutely repugnant, always have my whole life. People keep telling me I'll grow up and like start liking them. No, I have not. I hate them more now. But uh, if there was like an olive people, I'd hang out with them. I got no problem with all of people. I just don't think hatred should translate both ways. You know, it's it's a one or the other or both situation or neither. What the f are you saying? This city was a purgatory. Frederick had made sure of that, exiling me to a place he knew would make me miserable. But I held a glimmer of hope that it could also be a chance to start anew. After years of drowning in a pool of booze and prescription antidepressants, anything was an improvement. But war and suffering lingered in this hellhole and fungi were everywhere. Okay, more just blunt style across the board for immediate setup, which is like, you know, authors choose whether or not at the start of their story, they're just gonna take a big bucket and dump, and then we get to take advantage of that for the rest of the storytelling, or trying immediately, I guess more of like a Steven Erickson way, just tell things as they happen and let you fill in the blanks on your own. There's not a right or wrong answer there. I think both styles can absolutely be applied just fine, and it was a similar style to what we just read, Guilty Pleasures, just not as extreme. Um, I'm hoping, though, that the rest of this book uh, past chapter one, really takes advantage of how much exposition work is being done in chapter one, and then is able to like really uh, use all that to just not waste your time and really quickly get through, or not quickly, effectively get through a noir thriller type fungus story. And fungi were everywhere. Hop on, Neo Kanoko. These places have become wastelands, wrought by the disaster of worlds. My people, what the government had sold to Caprinians as the rebuilding of a liberated society, was in reality the world's most public open-air prison. A scam, a sham, just like my being here. Waves lapped rhythmically as the sun continued to rise. Seagulls squawked nearby. I returned to the small, decapitated head inside the bag. Sand dripped along decomposing skin, and my eyes began to water at thoughts of the past. The cool sting as tears trickled and pulled at the edges of my mask before starting to freeze. God damn, it is cold. We in a chilly place. Yeah, it seems like this chapter is trying to tell two separate stories at once. It's a little bit uh, back and forth. I had to clear my head and prioritize. What happened to this child? The neck appeared cleanly cut, but I leaned closer. A thin patch of skin had been removed near the jugular. Strange. Both eyes were removed or eaten post-mortem by sea lice, crabs, or fish. The skin was pop-marked and had peeled away from water exposure. What remained had a waxy quality and a pallid discoloration. The nose had deformed and the lips were half-eaten, decayed, as well as the victim's hair was shaved and the mushroom cap atop their head was gone, severed at the stem. All that was left was the bruised and bloated base connected to the skull. That was vivid. I, I really uh, like the detail of like letting us know like, yeah, they have a mushroom cap, but also hair. So I'm having a weird time visualizing it, but I get it. I'm hoping what I get next is like a clear description of how they differ visually in other ways, aside from a mushroom top from people. You never want to have that thing where it's like, I've invented a whole new race. What's different about them? Well, you know, aliens and Star Trek, how they have like a crinkle in the forehead? That. I burned with the impulse to look away but my investigative instinct urged me onward. I searched inside the bag, through the sand slurry around the partially submerged head. A section of cut off leg revealed bone amongst decaying muscle. I saw two more shapes, distended limbs, the flesh puffy and peeling. My optimism for an ID drew me to the child's partially open mouth. White filaments of mycelium grew out from between the lips, draping down like a macabre curtain. It's a little bit overdue. There's this like interesting contrast in the prose that I can't quite put into words why it's bugging me, but it's there. My stomach churned. I ignored my gut feeling to stop and turn away. I gently unlocked the stiff jaw, peering inside. The sight made me gag. A carpet of wet, white mold and mycelium coated the inside of the victim's mouth, tongue, roof, gums. The parasitic growth continued all the way back into the throat, where it clumped 
like dense cotton balls, probing for teeth with my gloved finger. Oh, oh, I just, no, I don't want to visualize putting my finger in that. I cringed at the cushiony softness inside. Not a single tooth, just a rancid stench. <sighs> okay, we're good, keep going. I pulled my finger from the victim's mouth. It was then that I saw the mold and the mycelin quiver. Don't, there better not be something alive in there. All of a sudden, the fungal threads began to shake. I fell backwards, startled. Half of my ass was submerged in freeding water and algae. The moist mycelin slithered out of the victim's maw. I really hope I'm saying mycelium, right? Whatever. Then the wooly mass clogging their throat exploded in a burst of spores. I like how the spores and mushroominess is already being brought into play. I just wish it wasn't so vile. <laughs> well done. It's, it's well done vile. Good, good God. The minute particles ejected outwards. You could, that was a really good excuse to use the word ejaculate there and you didn't take it. And I don't know if I respect you for not taking the low hanging fruit or I'm disappointed that we didn't. Both. They flew at me in a translucent mushroom cloud that I couldn't avoid. I scrambled back onto the damp sand on gloves and boots feeling the spores enter into my eyes. I blinked furiously, desperate to rub them out. Part of me was considering rinsing them out with seawater, even if it stung. At least that might have sterilized the spores. Fucking hell, I cursed. How could I be so goddamn careless? My eyeballs were raw and watery. I massaged them with the sleeve of my jacket, praying I wouldn't get infected. 10 years of the spore war, two years since it ended in Caprinian victory and occupation, and still, the only thing we had to fend off the fear of contagion were shitty masks and a dwindling supply of antifungal meds. Angrily, I tore off my examination gloves and mask and threw them onto the sand. I shoved a hand into my jacket pocket and took out a small plastic bottle, removing the cap. I shakily shoved two pills into my mouth and swallowed them dry. Though. I'd never heard of anyone actually getting infected. The anxiety of it kept me on edge, urging me to prevent a terrifying hypothetical. I stared at the head in the bag, microphagia attempting to override my rational mind. My limbs trembled and my teeth ground together. God damn it. I took a deep breath. I still had to do my bloody job, but there wasn't even a body left, just parts. I stood and stashed my pill bottle, shoving the examination gloves and my mask into a disposable bag. I unclipped the radio from my belt. My ass was frozen, pants covered in sand, a small price to pay to get away from that fucking head. I really like the descriptions of the world and the viscerality, I guess, of the story so far. I'm just having some trouble with especially the communication of emotion. Dialing in my radio, I spoke into the receiver. NKPD dispatch, this is Detective Hoffman of the Homicide Division, badge number 881. Do you read me? We copy Hoffman. A crackly female Female voice replied, 187 confirmed at Spirit Island. Send a forensics team over ASAP. Copy detective, over and out. I clipped my radio and returned to the dead child, glaring at the rotten head. I, okay, I actually have a question. Isn't it like police procedure that if a cop comes across a body, they don't touch it? They don't They do not do anything if it's clear that they're dead. Like obviously if they, they could feasibly still be alive, you do something. But like when they found the, the, the head in Jeffrey Dahmer's fridge, they didn't immediately touch it. What I think they would, like protocol since decades gone, I imagine, is just leave it, wait for forensics. As soon as any kind of like forensics technology became a part of, I really assume that is the protocol. I don't think a detective would necessarily be like, well, before they get here, I need to keep touching it. Maybe I'm being a dick and I should suspend my disbelief. I clipped my radio and returned to the dead child, glaring at the rotten head. I felt a nagging unease that it might burst open and release more spores. The cavernous void of the child's lifeless face and empty eye socket stared up at me, while frigid wind nipped at my exposed skin. Time stood still, and all I could do was grind my teeth beneath the aging contours of cold, reddened cheeks. There was no way I could pass this case off to anyone else. Why? You don't like these people. I don't understand that. Keep reading and find out, Daniel. Captain Ridgway would refuse, because he'd been dumping all the sh cases on me. Plus, no one in Homicide would care about a fungal kid. You don't care about a fungal kid! Especially with all the protests over missing children the past few months. Cops were burnt out, pissed off, and I was the bottom rung on a ladder full of small men with big egos. I sighed, praying this dead kid wouldn't be the death of me. Mold and mutilation a bag washed ashore. How the hell was I going to solve this one? And that is chapter one. There's a lot to like there. Uh, certainly different in terms of like world building, where you're pulling the gore from. Uh, it gave off stronger like seven vibes for obvious reasons than uh, I was expecting it to. Definitely more true detective than uh, what's like a, than, oh God, 
what, more true detective than uh, what's the other kind of noir where it's more corny than like grimdark. You know what I mean? It, it's coming across more grimdark is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so that's good. I just have some complaints with the writing that I think will be easy to overcome once the book's not trying to do so much so quickly. I feel like chapter one there could have been improved by not giving me uh, more details into this person's personal life and instead just focusing on the scenes so that in the next scene we learn more about them as a person. Just really set those stakes. To call back to Twin Peaks, like the, you don't learn about the person who finds Laura Palmer's body right away, right? Like the scene, the hook to get you there is just, oh, there's a dis discovery of this body and it's, it's terrifying. But, you know, that's my opinion. And from here, we are going to do one more chapter one. Before I make my grand decision, before the judgment from the goblin comes down, and it's not even necessarily going to be the best chapter. Like, it could be one that I think is bad, uh, that I just feel like, okay, I'm going to have a lot to say about this. So... We shall see. But for now, we are going to be reading. God, Kobo does not handle things that are not <laughs> formatted for it very well. I believe in you. Spin of Fate, e arc that is not very well sized to be on a Kobo. Oh boy, the PDFs on Kobo, one area of critique. They do not size properly. I didn't try a PDF on a Kindle. Does it do the same thing? Because this is gonna have way smaller text. I'm gonna have to be reading this like this for you all. I got LASIK. But LASIK don't make that readable. Oh God, what am I gonna do for prologues? I said I'd read chapter ones, but I, I guess I'll read a prologue too. We'll see. I'll do what feels natural. If this is like a girthy prologue, we could just do a prologue. I don't know. If I read Wheel of Time, just the prologue, would that have been the right choice for Eye of the World? Yeah, it probably would have been the better choice because chapter one is just a whole lot of like farming shenanigans. It's gonna have to be case by case. I just made the decision. You just watched me make the decision of how to treat this series going forward. Case by case. Prologue, a flash of white. Sharp twang pulled Aina from troubled dreams. She staggered to her feet, ignoring the protest of her muscles as she grabbed her bow and slung a quiver across her back. Razor wire strung across the craggy walls like the web of some monstrous spider. One of the trip wires stretched taut. Aina followed its trembling path out of the cave and into the moonless night. That was a, that was so, okay, in terms of what exactly what I was talking about, in terms of just like immediate immersion, the way I think a lot of books try to go for in just a series of what is happening in the moment in this scene, that was really good. Uh, good job, okay, damn, let's keep it moving. Her mother whittled a thumb-sized stone by the fire, her back rigid as a blade. What are you doing up so early? She barked without looking up from her task. Aina watched, transfixed, as her mother ran a finger over the stone, caressing away tiny chunks as if they were carved at knife point. But their mother had never needed a knife, not when she could shape the world around her through channeling. <coughs> the stone figure took on a form of a horned monkey with spines that glinted in the firelight. Will you give me that once you're done? Anna asked. I want to add it to my collection. I'll give you a tight slap if you don't go back to sleep. You'll never learn to channel without proper rest. Something triggered one of the trip wires. Anna barely had gotten the words out when her mother sprang to her feet with a curse. I meant a wild animal, Mama. The wire is intact. It would have snapped under the weight of a human. Say that part first, idiot girl! Her mother scolded before settling back by the fire. Aina ignored the withering glare, cast her away. The trip wires hardly mattered, given her mother had channeled a protective shield around their hideout. Caldrav's stupid soldiers would bounce right off if they approached, alerting her of their presence and providing her mother's inexhaustible wrath with another target for a change. Okay, uh, we might have a quick winner here. This, I'm getting like really nice prose vibes, solid flow to the scene, and characterization just delivered through dialogue without having to over-describe admirably well. Uh, okay, and can you tell like I'm having an easier time reading it? Maybe this is just me. I could be an idiot, I am. But I, if something is written in a way that I feel like is better, at least to my own personal taste, I can read it out loud, I can read it to myself really quickly. A great example of this for me is Murderbot. Murderbot, I can burn through a page in half the time of so many other authors. And yeah, it's a bit more simple in its prose, but it's, it's about how quickly my brain just grasps how one sentence leads into a next. There's something about like the composition of the paragraph level, which I'm sure I'm not using a technical term there, but who cares, uh, that my brain almost goes to the next thought before the book even does in a leading way, not in a, uh, a too obvious a way. And I feel like that's happening here. Uh, yeah, I'm, you got what I'm, I'm, I'm going to shut up and keep reading. And where the blazes do you think you're going? Her mother demanded to get us some food. I'm starving, mama. Her mother made to stand again, 
but Aina placed a hand on her arm. Under the threadbare cloak, her mother's arm felt brittle as a twig, shadows ringing her eyes, and wrinkles forked across her withered skin. It's probably just a rat, Aina said. Let me handle it. You get some rest for once. The conflicted relationship is established. Her mother? Bit of a but she loves her. She's still taking care of her. There's obviously a lot to learn from her as well. Point, 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 point. You've had it from me if you're not back within 10 minutes. Anna nodded with a glance at the wire. It gave a violent tremor and stretched to the verge of snapping. Larger than a rat, Anna set off into the skeletal forest, squinting through the gloom. 14 years in Malin had given her excellent night vision, but today was murkier than usual, as if the misery of the realm had condensed into a grim fog that obscured everything beyond a few feet in any direction. <sighs> I'm in! Aina's heart stopped at a gleam of cobalt through the haze. That can't be what I think it is. But as she inched closer, the monstrous form grew clear. A giant Nagamore, asleep outside the shimmering dome of her mother's shield. The peacock snake lay in a mound of coils, each as wide as a tree trunk. Aina crept past the beast and released a tremulous breath. It was just their stinking luck that the one thing in Malin deadlier than enemy soldiers had settled for a nap this close to their hideout. At least it hadn't slithered onto any of her traps. That would have thrown it into a rage. Quiet as a mouse, Anna followed the wire until she came upon her prey. A runt of a fox thrashed in her snare, teeth gnashing and yellow eyes rolled back in fear. The beast's emaciated form carried enough meat to last them three days at most. Aina's stomach gave a painful rumble. Three days of fox meat would be a luxury after weeks of dried grass and the occasional lizard. She drew her bow and knocked an arrow. Best kill it before it bit her hand off. The fox's eyes bulged as she neared. Blood stained its fur as it strained against the razor wire. Don't look at me like that, Aina muttered. Had it been born to the blessed realm of Maana, this fox might have grown powerful and majestic. Instead, it was born cursed. Cursed like her to live and Malin, at least unlike Aina, it could die and be spared from its miserable existence by an arrow to the heart. I am emotionally invested right now. The soft whimper stopped Aina on her tracks. She looked down to see a trembling lump of fur, small enough to fit in her palm. A tiny wet nose brushed her ankle. A pup gave a pitiful squeak as it crawled forward on stubby legs. The fox and the wires snarled as she struggled to reach her whimpering newborn. Oh no, we're gonna do the thing where they have to like raise the baby, but they're gonna eat the mom. It'd be really funny if they ate the baby too. <laughs> it would drive home the point that the author is going for here that like this world is miserable really effectively by being like, oh, mercy killing this baby is also just the better choice. <laughs> Wait, don't take me saying mercy killing the baby would be the better choice out of context. That's, I mean, there's situations that could be stopping. I'm stopping. I'm stopping and moving on. Aina lowered her bow, chest folding over at the familiarity of the scene. A small creature and its mother trying desperately to survive the fate that had been dumped upon them. How would this fox pup live without its angry, snarling mother to protect it? Is she going to let the fox go? Uh, of everything I've read today, the fate of these foxes is what is compelling me the most. Stop moving, Anna hissed. She unsheathed the short knife and cut through the wires. The injured fox jerked away from her at once. Anna stepped back, knife raised. Okay, she's just letting it go. We're, this is going to be nice. It's going to be a nice moment. That's good. But the creature had no interest in attacking. The fox snatched the tiny pup with her teeth and bound into the darkness. Hunger clawing at her stomach. Anna trudged back toward the cave. Ah, uh, okay. I, yeah, okay. I'm, we're going to see that again reflected later on in the book, I'm sure. Be a metaphor or callback or whatever you want to call it. Terminology. The immense form of the slumbering Nagamore came into view. Then the world flashed around her. For a moment, the forest disappeared. Anna found herself suspended in a vast white nothingness. She had never seen it before. This eerie blankness, silent and still, it surrounded her. Squ we're squidwording. This is, we're squidwording, okay. Sudden as it had come, the whiteness faded. Aina returned to the same spot in the forest within her mother's shield, feet away from the Nagamore. What the hell just happened? Is this gonna be like a secret sci-fi book? Are we, I'm, okay. I almost just said an example of a book that does that, but that would have been a spoiler, so I'm glad I didn't. Aina had no time to ponder the thought. From beyond the shield came a soft, ragged scrape of scale over stone. Why, why are you sleeping? I did not ask you to sleep. Wake up, please. Wake up, please. Why are you sleeping? Powered off. Why are you powering off? No! 
I did not ask you to power off. Um, we're stuck on three loading bars now. I said all these nice things about Kobo and now it's dying. Okay, it just needed to reboot. Anyway, Aina had no time to ponder the thought. From beyond the shield came a soft, ragged scrape of scale over stone. Aina's blood ran cold as the beast, awakened by the flash of white, raised its head and turned. Bulbous eyes gleamed through the murk, the promise of pain in their bloody depths. Then, several tons of scale and sinew lunged forward and slammed against the shield. It held an excruciating second before shattering in an eruption of light. Aina fled, gaze lowered as she stumbled through the splintered landscape of Malin. Without the shield, locking eyes with the Nagamore would induce intense hallucinations. Three years of torment, packed into three agonizing minutes. Whoa, okay. Aina had no need for more. The stones rattled under the Nagamore's advancing bulk. Aina dodged the beast's snapping beak to whip out her bow and fire at its underbelly. A tail swept through the air, batting away her arrows with a plume of rounded feathers. The beast twisted and struck again. Aina's bow sang in desperation as she loosed more arrows, but the Nagamore's serpentine body raged and wrapped around her, an inescapable whirlwind of pain. Aina's quiver poked her back, the contents of her various pouches digging into her hips. The Nagamore squeezed tighter and crushed the air from her lungs. The ground beneath Aina erupted, and a pillar of rock pierced the beast's cobalt blue scales. The Nagamore surged upward with the rising rock, screeching as a cascade of blood poured from its flank. Freed from its hold, Aina leaped to the ground and raised her eyes to meet a pair deadlier than the Nagamore's. Mama, blasted fool! Her mother snarled, lowering her hands and releasing the channeling. The ground stopped rumbling, and the rocks froze in place. Although the impaled beast continued writhing, waking a sleeping Nagamore, I'll flay you to the last bit of your soul if Kaldraf's soldiers don't get to us first. I didn't do anything, Aina wailed. I was only walking when a flash of white light came from nowhere. Her mother stiffened. Before she could retort, the Nagamore broke free of its stony prison and dove toward the ground, sinuous body curving like a scythe, swearing. Her mother swiped a thumb across her forehead. Mottled energy pulsed from her palms as the fractured earth danced beneath her fingertips. In response, the Nagamore loosed a soul-searing cry and swatted away her mother's boulders as if they were flies. The size of this thing I'm a little bit confused on, but we're good. Run! Her mother shoved Aina forward. Her dark energy swirled around them in a protective dome. The Nagamore's relentless assault eroded it bit by bit. As they ran, Aina glimpsed something twinkling in the distance, a beacon of light amidst the gloom of Malin, an elegant silver archway, and beyond it, brighter fields and a brighter sky. It was one of the Torana, a gateway leading to another realm. This silver one led to the upper realm of Mayana, which meant Aina and her mother could never get through. They were lowers, with souls steeped in sin, souls that spun in the wrong direction. The Torana would deny them entry as it had all these years. Such was the law. I am digging this world building. Okay, I like this. Let's keep him moving. Aina's heart shriveled as she neared the Torana, the Nagamore smashing against her mother's defenses. She pivoted in front of the archway and reached for an arrow, but her blood-slicked heels slipped in the mud, and Aina's left leg slid backward, straight between the silver columns. Soft grass brushed Aina's toes, and she let out a gasp. Her mother turned to her, inhaling sharply at the sight of Aina's sandaled foot planted in the upper realm, while the other remained rooted in the filth of Malin. The white flashed before, she whispered, so it's true, your soul reversed. You're light enough to enter Mayana. That, that can't be, Aina said. None could ascend from Malin to Mayana. It wasn't possible to flip the spin of a soul. The Nagamore clacked its beak, arching its neck to strike. Aina grabbed her mother's bony wrist and tried tugging her through the Torana, but the gateway did not yield, an invisible barrier stopping Alan's mother from following her into the upper realm. Go! Damn, I did not see this coming, but all right, damn! Splitting us up in the prologue and the mom's gonna be like, oh, you gotta go. And then she's probably gonna see her. So you gonna watch her mom die? This origin is hardcore. Aina knew her mother was not a particularly good person. She wasn't as bad as Kaldrav the Cruel, the despotic king of Malin, but she was bad enough, years of violence weighing her down. And if Torana had denied her mother, yet allowed Aina though, you're my Ani now, foolish girl. Her mother ripped her wrist away from Aina's grip. Toronic law has decreed it. Get away from me and stay in your realm. Not without you, Aina declared as she stepped back into Malin. 
I'll stay here, Mama. I'll... Her mother cut her off with a slap that split Aina's lip. Feather soul, counter spinner, she growled, shoving Aina back through the Torana. I don't want to see your face. If you set foot in this realm, I'll smack you till your skin turns blue. In the dim light of Malin, her mother's cheeks were wet. I'll make you suffer worse than a Nagamore's glare. I'll... Whatever her mother meant to say next was drowned out by the Nagamore slamming against the Tirana. Its fetid breath grazed Aina's cheeks, the grimy blue scales an inch from her fingernails. But for all the ferocity with which it crashed against the archway, the beast could not enter Mayana. Like Aina's mother, the Nagamore's soul spun backward. Tauranic law would not allow it to spill its filth into the upper realm. Aina watched through the pillars in horror as her mother clashed with the beast, channeling stone and raising up small mountains against its twisting, thrashing mass. Aina knocked an arrow and made to race into Malin to assist her, but an enormous slab of stone spurred up to the other side of Torana. Her mother's channeling had blocked the path that Toronic Law had let Aina pass. I am... I'm so in. I'm so invested. This is impressive. Let's go. Mama, Aina screamed. Let me through. Unlike her, Aina could not channel the stone away. So she beat it until her knuckles bled and the Nagamore's cries faded. Please, Mama, don't do this. Don't leave me here all alone. There was no reply. Only the shuffle of footsteps away from the Torana, away from Aina. Oh, because like when you're young, especially, there is no bigger fear than being alone. Like that's a fear that follows everyone from birth to death. No one wants to be alone forever unless you're like a true hermit, which if you are, cool. Do your live your life. Be happy. I have no problem with that. But uh, like for people who really want to be around other people, <laughs> so being like utterly alone is a fate arguably worse than death. It's <laughs> horrid. Uh, people always say like, oh, I could go days out seeing someone. Yeah, so could I. And that wouldn't bother me too much, but months, years, and then the additional like alone of not even knowing where you are, like take you and just drop you somewhere where you don't even speak like a language or there's maybe not even other people. That becomes a whole different game. Mama. Aina fell to all fours on the sweet scented grass, tears streaming down her cheeks. Don't leave me. Warm sunlight drenched her back, and the air, crisp and thick with birdsong, Aina paid it no heed as she lay there for hours, pounding weakly at the Torana. Oh god, this beautiful scene surrounding this tragedy, what's up? That's weird to be happy about. For the first time since her birth, Aina was in paradise. Mayana was an idyllic realm, free of Malin's monsters and violence and corruption, free from the tyranny of Kaldrav's reign from being hunted by his soldiers. It was a realm protected by Tauronic law, where only those light of soul and good of heart were permitted to live. A realm that had admitted Ayana, but would never admit her mother. Mayana was a heavenly place, yet to Aina, it felt like hell. We're gonna call it there. Case by case, we're calling it there, because I want to read that. That's the winner. I'm picking, what was the name of this? <laughs> Spin of fate. We're going. We're going. Quick insert, because I forgot to actually record my like justification for my choice in the original video, which I'm going to uh, in the future. I am going to say the reason I'm picking this one is it just kind of emotionally grabbed me more than any of the others. There's certainly some cliches to its setup, no doubt. I've even read an opening uh, oddly similar in the show first and last that I do before. But the way the emotions were communicated and the kind of class divide that's being emphasized thematically, super tantalizing. I'm in. Uh, I did really like from uh, the Guilty Pleasure book that we had this kind of really personality-filled character in a world that's going to be just instantly appealing to me just from my own preferences. Though, I've read a lot of stories like that, and I can totally see how for its time it might have been like a really new interesting thing. Right now, Guilty Pleasures is just not something I'm burning to read, though I'm probably going to eventually. And Mushroom Blues too. I probably will read one day. I liked its opening, its vibe, kind of leaning into those true detective angles. I hope it has a little bit more subtlety uh, moving forward past chapter one, which I think it will. Um, but it just didn't excite me as much as the emotional pull of uh, Spin of Fate. So there you go. Back to the outro. Oh, so look forward to a review of that next week. Let me know if you'd like me to review Kobo as a whole. And like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Check out my book, Neon Ghosts. And of course, I'm going to have all the books we uh, read from here linked down below through Bookshop if I can. And if you buy through Bookshop, you support local bookstores. So that's really cool. And uh, yeah, have a great one, y'all. Let me know if you like the new series. Goodbye.